Hey everybody, welcome to the Wonderful World of Remnant Radio. In this program, I've got Dr. K with us, and we're talking about an introduction to ecclesiology. We're talking about what the church is, its formation, all that fun stuff. Stay tuned for an exciting program. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. If you didn't know, we talk here on Remnant Radio about a lot of different theological subjects. We interview Anglicans, Methodists, Lutherans, Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, the whole gambit, and we talk about Christian theology. One of the subjects that come up quite frequently is that of uh, ecclesiology. How is the church structured? What is it? What defines it? Everyone comes at it from a different vantage. So this is one of many episodes we've done on it. We encourage you to go check out the archives where we've done lots of stuff on ecclesiology. If you're new to Remnant Radio, however, and aren't really familiar with all the different things that we do, I'd con- uh, encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Make sure to like the video. So we come out with content like this all the time. So if you're here watching it, just know more content coming down the pike. Uh, additionally, uh, if you're here at Remnant, you've been watching all the different stuff that we're doing and it's hard to keep up, man. We got courses and conferences and videos that we're constantly out uploading. Uh, how do you how do you stay in touch with all the different things that we're doing, our traveling and speaking engagements, those kinds of things? Make sure to subscribe to the newsletter. That'd be the best way to stay in touch with all the things that we're doing. You'll get discount codes and promo codes for courses and conferences and all that fun stuff. Uh, in addition, you'll stay up today on all the different things that are happening here at Remnant. Now, you might be asking, Josh, you are not in your typical studio. What is going on? Well, I live in Oklahoma, and there is inclement weather, uh, such as hail and tornadoes on the horizon. So uh, I have decided to hang out here. If you see all of a sudden I'm in a much darker space, it's because I'm in my basement trying to finish this program with three children and a dog. So it, who knows? It could. We might just toss it over to Michael Roundtree to finish, depending on how things go. Uh, Michael, how are you doing over there in Oklahoma City, my friend? Oh, I'm doing great, man. Doing great. Uh, you know, I got rid of some hair on my face. So I'm glad that you that. didn't call it a beard. The, <laughs> I, you know, we, we, I could never quite bring myself to call it a beard after all the disparaging comments from you guys. Um, Dr. K, my co-hosts, we have one, another co-host who joins us on Wednesday. They always knocked my beard. So um, anyway, I got rid of it. Actually, it hurt my feelings so much. It's gone. So <laughs> my you. wife likes it better this way. So I'll probably roll this way for a while. But uh, anyway, life's good in OKC. Now we're calling you Dr. K, which stands for Dr. Karkinen. I don't pronounce Finnish well, but uh, it's a, it's a good, uh, from Finland. Yes. yes. And so give us the proper pronunciation of your name. Did I do Belli- it right? Belli- Matti Karkinen. Okay, we're going to roll with Dr. K. (laughs) So Dr. K, uh, now you're from Finland, but you live a lot of your time in LA and you teach theology and things like that. So just maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, some of the things that you're that you've written before we dive into our topic for today. Right. Uh, First of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, For the past 24 years, I have served as professor of systematic theology at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, uh, Los Angeles. And um, I also have a part-time teaching position at the University of Helsinki. Uh, It's uh, called uh, Docent of Ecumenics. Um, University of Helsinki is my alma mater. I did my doctorate and post-doctorate there, uh, focusing on ecumenical theology. I've also taught theology and lived uh, in Thailand. We lived there as a young family in the 1990s, and I'm proud to say that I taught theology in Bangkok uh, in Thai, not in English, uh, of course, with some um, accent. Um, and um, I, my major academic work, out of which many of the textbooks also Uh, stem from. My major academic work is a five-volume set of Christian doctrine. It's called A Constructive Christian Theology for the Pluralistic World. It was published uh, between 2013 and 17 by Erdmans, and the five volumes uh, comprise altogether about 
almost 3,000 pages. And I do theology a little bit differently from what it has been done in the past. Namely, I, of course, I look at all the Christian doctrines from Revelation, the Trinity, to Christ, to eschatology. Um, I first look at what the Bible, Christian history, and contemporary theology is saying, including the contextual and global diversity. But then I make two uh, additions, and that makes my theology distinctive. First of all, I engage widely natural and behavioral sciences. For example, when I talk about, say, the doctrine of creation, human being, eschatology, forgiveness, so I also engage uh, widely uh, scientists and uh, even more distinctively with all Christian doctrines. I also have a dialogue with Islam, uh, Judaism, Hinduism and Buddhism. So it's also a um, in the faith um, exploration, uh, even though I write as a, um, an evangelical theologian. And therefore, my textbooks, for example, the one we are talking about now, an introduction to ecclesiology, uh, its distinctive feature is not only its ecumenical uh, breadth and diversity, namely, I'm talking about uh, Christian ecclesiologists from uh, across the ecumenical spe- spectrum, but I also look at what are the visions and notions or conceptions of um, religious community in Islam, Judaism, uh, Hinduism, and Buddhism. So that's briefly what I've been doing and, and what I do. Uh, and that's a, it's a very interesting take. I mean, like I, I told you before the show, uh, there are those kind of overviews of historical context of like, hey, let's talk about prophecy. Like we interviewed Ben Witherington recently and, and Ben Witherington talked to us about prophecy in the uh, Old Testament. And he just put it in a framework of ancient Near Eastern cultures and the prophecy yeah. that was taking place in their historical time period. But then to compare like in a subject such as, you know, ecclesiology, what is the church? And then compare it to other religions like Judaism, Hinduism, uh, and, and Islam and say that, hey, h- how does this worldview of church governance function in comparison to other religious systems of our day? I think it's very interesting. I don't know that I've ever seen it being done before. I think it's very unique. Uh, but I'd like you to maybe weigh in a little bit since you did Uh, in the opening chapters of your book, talk about the Eastern Orthodox Church. You talked about the Roman Catholic Church and talked about the Protestant Reformation um, and just kind of Protestantism in general. You you addressed very specific groups within Protestantism. But just in general, as we set up the subject of ecclesiology, one, I guess my first question is, what is ecclesiology for people who are watching? And then two, how has ecclesiology uh, been interpreted in those, I mean, the three biggest spheres of Christianity being the East, Rome, and the Protestant tradition? Right. Uh, thank you. Wonderful question. First of all, ecclesiology is uh, simply what um, Christian churches and uh, what uh, Christian tradition is thinking about the church, about the church and uh, church's life and ministry. Similarly to, for example, we have a theology of sacraments or we have a theology of Christ. And it is very interesting and uh, important to note that um, while in contemporary life, in contemporary theology, ecclesiology plays a very big role in international and ecumenical theology, it took until Protestant Reformation in the 16th century for the full scale uh, doctrine of the church to be developed. And it uh, happened in the context of debates about what is a true church as opposed to a false church. If you think about the disputes between what used to be the Roman Catholic Church and then um, Protestant churches, which emerged out of uh, the uh, Reformation. Now, uh, broadly speaking, it can be said that there are three major streams of ecclesiological traditions. One is uh, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox uh, traditions, which uh, focus uh, more on the church's 
sacramental and liturgical life and they are of the opinion that um, the nomenclatures for ministers are not optional. They are not at your choice. You need to have a bishop uh, to oversee the sacramental celebration and so forth. And they tend to be a little bit more hierarchic and kind of many layers. The second one is the mainline Protestant and Anglican traditions in which uh, the focus is um, more not only on the sacraments, but on the preaching of the word of God. And like in Lutheran tradition, my own, there are Lutheran churches which have bishops, like my own um, church, ELCA, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and its partner church in my native land, uh, Finland. They have bishops, but there are many Lutheran churches um, uh, which are not episcopal, they don't have a bishop. And then the third uh, main uh, stream of ecclesiological traditions is what can be elusively, broadly named as free churches. Among them, Pentecostals, uh, Pentecostal Charismatics are by far the biggest, but Baptists, um, many Methodists, um, uh, many holiness movements, um, uh, congregationalists, and then a growing number of independent churches, particularly here in the US and particularly here in California, where I have taught theology for the past 24 years at Fuller Theological Seminary. There's a huge number of so-called independent churches, which are a part of the free church uh, ecclesiological stream but they have their own governance. They often have their own Bible schools. They often um, uh, exercise their own independence in terms of uh, church polity. Even if they are networked with others, they are um, uh, almost um, fully independent. So that's a kind of broad uh, um, survey of ecclesial traditions. And I talk about each one of them uh, in my book and on the, um, with regard uh, to the middle uh, category, the mainstream uh, Protestants, I have a um, separate chapter on Lutheran ecclesiology, which is the oldest among the mainstream Protestants. And then I have a chapter for the reformed churches, for example, Presbyterian. While they are in many ways similar, they are also different um, for cultural, religious, and theological reasons. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a lot going into how different traditions understand ecclesiology. You just, you mentioned culture is one of them. You talked about the Protestant Reformation being very foundational in the 16th century as they're talking about what's a true church, what's a false church. So maybe you could talk to us about just from the very beginning up until even today, how did various schisms and splits and reformation intermingled with cultural realities, how did all of this play together toward giving or, uh, or helping the church develop its own ecclesiology? Because we kind of want to say like, well, shouldn't our ecclesiology just develop from the Bible? Like I read first Timothy three and my ecclesiology is there for this. What I hear you saying is like, yeah, everybody's reading the same scripture, but their lenses for reading the scripture are different based on the time period in which they were living. Reformation, split, schism, culture, all of this. So could you talk to us through these various historical realities in the development of the church's self-understanding? Yes, um, this is a, a very important question. <clears throat> First of all, when we go to the New Testament, while every theologian and every church um, teacher agrees that um, in the aftermath of uh, the day of Pentecost and after the ascension of Jesus Christ, a uh, Christian community emerged. That is not disputed. But um, if you look uh, more carefully at the testimonies and um, t 
teachings and experiences of the church in the New Testament, you will notice that there's a lot of diversity already in the New Testament. Let me give you uh, a very simple, well-known example. If you think of the church uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul's epistle to, first, uh, to, to the, Cor the first epistle to the Corinthian church, it was a highly Pentecostal, charismatic church. Paul begins the letter by saying that uh, you don't lack anything in any gifts. At the same time, they also had many internal divisions, strives, and uh, leadership uh, struggles and all of that. So that was a very enthusiastic, dynamic Pentecostal church, whereas if you go to the uh, somewhat later parts of the New Testament, say the so-called uh, Catholic epistles, they include, uh, for example, uh, two letters of uh, Timothy and uh, one to Titus um, that are penned uh, by followers of Paul, there you see a fairly structured church, uh, very little talk uh, explicitly about the spirit or enthusiasm. Um, there are um, like uh, some kind of offices um, already established and uh, all kinds of uh, ministry patterns like uh, preaching, liturgy, social work and so forth. And so it means that uh, beginning from the New Testament uh, diversity of experiences, various kinds of ecclesiological or ecclesial ex uh, expressions emerged in early Christianity. And here, something very important. Nowadays in theology, in the third millennium, we talk a lot about the global nature, the global diversity of the church, and we should. But it is often mispresented as a new phenomenon. It's not. When we go back to the very end of the New Testament times and beginning of early Christianity, <clears throat> in various geographic, cultural, uh, religio, uh, religious uh, environments, various type of church structures began to emerge. For example, what we nowadays call um, the, the Christian West, which uh, consists of uh, Roman Catholicism and Protestant Anglicans, those churches are quite different from what uh, is called Eastern Orthodox or the Orthodox churches. Or if you go to early centuries, you have uh, Syriac churches, uh, uh, Syrian and others. They began to develop their own church patterns their own government parents. They named their leaders differently and uh, they had a different kinds of emphasis. For example, in Eastern Orthodox Church, which is the uh, so often named as the oldest uh, Christian church, there's a lot of emphasis on mysticism. There's a lot of emphasis on salvation as deification or theosis, uh, becoming God, uniting with God. Uh, and, and so forth. So uh, those uh, those diversities already began to emerge. And by the time of the fourth, let alone fifth century, there were two main streams of Christian ecclesiological and theological traditions. One, the Greek speaking Eastern Orthodox, and we would add to it also the Syriac and other um, uh, those languages. And then the uh, Latin-speaking Western Christianity. It took until uh, 1054, in the beginning of the second millennium, for those two churches to formally uh, have a split. Uh, and uh, there are reasons why it happened uh, 1054. But already beginning from the third or the fourth century, they began to have their own life, they didn't often talk to each other and uh, because they used uh, either Latin or Greek as their main theological language. The theologians, for example, St. Augustine, the great theologian, did not know well Greek and th therefore he was not able to follow 
all the ecclesiological and sacramental and other debates in the Christian East. But by the time we came um, to close to present Reformation, say about 200 years before the 16th century Reformation, in the so-called Roman Catholic Church, um, we, are, we are talking about the Latin-speaking church, there arose questions about what is the ultimate authority for the church and theology. Is it scripture? Or is it a scripture and the growing and developing Christian tradition? And so forth. And those debates were not reconciled within the Christian church. And therefore, by the time of the what we call now uh, uh, reformations, because there's a present reformation, Roman Catholic reformation, Anglican reformation, so forth. By the time of the reformations, these disputes had become so acute and so severe that ultimately the church was split. And the main uh, question was not about how to interpret scripture, even though it's very important. It was not even about how to understand the doctrine of justification, even though it was about that. It was what is the ultimate authority and the foundation on which the church um, is standing. And uh, Protestants um, emphasized um, more robustly the written word without, um, of course, denying the importance of tradition. And uh, Roman Catholicism built more on the kind of mutual um, relationship between the written scripture and the way the church uh, understands it. And now when we come to the 20th century, we are living the, the, already the, the 21st, but when we come to the end of the 20th century, we have a big um, event uh, happening. For example, in 1948, the World Council of Churches uh, was established, which is an attempt uh, to help various Christian churches to talk to each other. It's not to build a world church, but to help uh, various churches to come closer to each other. In the 1960s, there was the formative Vatican Council II, when the Roman Catholic Church updated and uh, revised its doctrine. And one of the biggest uh, documents is uh, on the church. It's called uh, Lumen Gentium and it is the dogmatic uh, constitution on the church in which Roman Catholic Church wonderfully well defined its understanding of ecclesiology. So from where it began in the diversity of the New Testament through all of these struggles, we have come a long way to where we are now. And in the beginning of the third millennium, the picture of the Christian church is the following. About one half of all Christians, about 50%, are Roman Catholic, and they will hold their own numbers, maybe grow. Um, one, another one-fourth, about 25%, are Pentecostal Charismatics, either Pentecostal movements or independent Charismatics, or like uh, Charismatics within the Roman Catholic Church. There are about 150 million Roman Catholic um, Charismatics. That's twice the number of my own global church, <laughs> Lutheran World Federation. And then the remaining one-fourth, the 25 percent, is a split into two sections. One half of the one-fourth is uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, Christians, there are about 300 million. And the rest is Lutherans, Baptists, Methodists, uh, Congregationalists, uh, you name it. So we live uh, now in a uh, in a world in which the church uh, is divided into number of uh, these blocks, and there's a lot of global and contextual diversity within each church block. Interesting. I, I'd like, uh, if you can, to kind of weigh in on, uh, this is more of a personal, maybe it's a personal question. Right now we've been talking about the kind of historic 
tradition that it, as it relates to the East, Rome, Protestantism, uh, we've talked about how over history, those theological views have kind of evolved over time uh, because of the historical context that these traditions find themselves in. Uh, but, you know, as a, as a Lutheran, uh, there is a big emphasis from Luther on the priesthood of all believers. That was a big emphasis on Calvin, uh, the vocation and calling conversation of of not having a sacred uh, secular divide uh, and really rising the laity. Um, and yet uh, there seems to be um, a strong uh, distinction even within Lutheran traditions, as I would consider it a high church tradition and not what was typically considered a low church tradition. So the, the Lutherans are still going to have uh, bishops o over their traditions. They're going to have, or presiding pastors, sometimes the effective, you know, equivalent of a bishop, right, um, over regions of their churches. And they have, you know, uh, d different synods uh, that kind of govern some of the affairs of local churches. I'd be curious right now, um, how you understand the priesthood of believers. I mean, certainly there's a historical uh, rootedness of that in the Protestant Reformation, but as time has evolved, certainly with like the Pentecostal charismatic movement, the empowerment of all of God's people has certainly been re-emphasized there. But then even culturally, the reinfor the, the reinforcement of like Western individualism of being able to pick and choose and like having, you know, your own physical autonomy, those kinds of things I think have driven uh, a kind of radical Western individualism that might be on the maybe dangerous side of things. Could you maybe just weigh in on the priesthood of believers as it relates to ecclesiology uh, and, and where we find ourselves in this kind of historical moment and, and your personal opinion on it? Yes. Um, if you go again back to the New Testament, uh, it is clear from the teaching of uh, St. Paul particularly that um, every a uh, Christian um, or the church member um, is a uh, should uh, have a ministry and a gifting. Paul even speaks about the fact that uh, to each uh, a gift is given. There are different gifts, there are different ministries, there are different tasks. But the idea is that uh, even if, like in the New Testament, there were uh, what were, there were like um, leaders who were called with various names, like for example, episcopos, out of which the bishop comes. It means basically overseer or deacon, the table servant as it is. So even when there were kind of emerging leadership uh, patterns of uh, more or less full-time workers, the idea was that um, the, the whole church, um, every member uh, is a minister. By the time um, we came to the, yeah, and let me mention one thing. It's also interesting that um, uh, by the end of the first Christian century, around uh, AD 90, AD 100, um, we have a historical record of the Consolidates emergence and consolidation of episcopacy, namely bishop. For example, Saint Ignatius um, of Antioch was a great um, leader who advocated, and many others. But again, their idea was not that because we have a bishop, then bishop and the pastors do everything. But soon there developed a three-tiered ministry pattern. The highest was the uh, bishop who was at the time the, like the senior pastor of the uh, community, not like a diocese, which, which we now have. But there was a bishop, and second, uh, there was a pastor, often called presbyter, and then there was the deacon. Um, and this uh, three-tiered ministry pattern was um, supposed to help the whole church to be equipped for ministry. But by the time we came to middle uh, ages, say in the beginning of the second millennium, the kind of um, the emphasis on sacramental and, um, and sacerdotal ministry meant that um, a definite um, difference and distinction between the lay persons and the priestly caste emerged. It has uh, its um, roots earlier, but the idea was that uh, there's a, a qualitative difference 
between normal lay people, even if they minister much, and uh, the, the priests and the bishops. And that was contested at the time of a Protestant Reformation. For example, um, Luther himself, he was a former Augustinian monk. When he came out from the um, uh, monastery and began the reform, reformatory work, he spoke very strongly and robustly um, in defense of the ministry of the whole people of God, like the priesthood of all people of God. At the same time, he did not do away, Luther did not do away with ordained ministry. In Augsburg uh, Confession, which is our most important um, confessional book, among many confessional books, uh, paragraph 14 says that um, the ordained ministers are needed for the sake of the order and that uh, the ministers are not above the church, they are a part of the church. They facilitate, so to speak, that's my paraphrase, they facilitate the ministry of all. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what happened um, after Protestant Reformation, both uh, on the Lutheran and Reformed side, the kind of old time parochial um, area concentrated um, um, model of church um, was established <clears throat> and uh, therefore many free churches, Anabaptists and then Baptists, other free churches, they um, were born and they emerged because they said we affirm the idea of the priesthood of all believers but we want to put it into practice. And so among those free churches, uh, Anabaptists, Baptists and others, uh, basically every Christian person could do all the Christian tasks, even if they had also ministers and leaders. And by the time we come to the, um, to the eve or uh, say to the, the end of the 19th century and the eve of the 20th century when, Penteco when the Pentecostal movement arose, there was a powerful call for all Christians to be baptized with the Spirit, to receive the gift, and then be ministers and missionaries even to the ends of the earth. And now, when we live in the beginning of the third millennium, it is interesting to see that among all churches, even Roman Catholic Church, there is a push towards a more free church type of um, opening of the ministry opportunities to all uh, church members and there's a drive and towards a more communal idea of ministry you, even though even uh, though if i add one would not put uh -huh. though even nowadays in the roman catholic uh, ecclesiology there is a qualitative difference between an ordained priest, that's the Lumen Gentium, the, um, the document on the church, uh, paragraph uh, um, 8 or 10 says that uh, um, the ordination um, leaves a kind of uh, intelligible mark and, and makes the, the, the person uh, qualitatively differently. We Protestants do not believe it. We believe that while there are differences of calling, there are different gifts, that there are full-time ministers, everybody basically can do everything. Hmm. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious, what's your take on that though? Uh, as, a, as a Lutheran guy that I would assume is in a high church tradition and that there would be a strong distinction, do you, do you think that this move to mobilization, to this kind of free church model um, that, that you're, you're articulating, do you think that's a net positive? Do you think that there are going to be some hurdles that we don't foresee coming that are going to that are going to create some problems? Um, do you, do you think it's a generally a good thing that hey, like this is this is where the spirit is leading the church? Like how how do you assess yeah. that? Yeah, I see it uh, generally as a positive and much much needed uh, turn. I also agree with um, my own church's confessional books um, in terms of. Um, kind of full-time or ordained uh, ministry needed for the sake of order. Order in the sense of um, those who are um, 
better equipped uh, theologically and pastorally and who are able to walk before the flock. But at the same time, I also uh, yearn for the return to the kind of uh, living out of the priesthood, of the principle of the priesthood of all believers. Let me give an example. Last week I returned um, from a lecture tour from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, um, and I was uh, hosted uh, part of the trip uh, by the Mekane Jesus uh, Church and Mekane Jesus Seminary, which is the world's largest Lutheran church, more than 10 million uh, members in that one Ethiopian church. They have been able as Lutherans to mobilize to mobilize a lot of lay folks. Uh, they have blessed uh, evangelists. Um, they have been able to ordain pastors with much less uh, academic training yet available. Um, they also have a good uh, academic training. But the point is that they have opened up um, venues and uh, they have uh, cancelled some obstacles, if that uh, is a good way of saying it in English, because there are many hurdles um, in the way to a wider ministry pattern in many of the traditional churches. So we can learn a lot about um, Mekani Jesus Church. It grows, it uh, expands, it um, plants new churches, uh, which is a phenomenon not common among many uh, mainstream um, churches um, nowadays in, in the global north. Hmm. Okay, uh, maybe we could shift gears a little bit and focus on the role of the Eucharist, because, yeah. you know, in the Eastern tradition, they love to, to talk about uh, the strong emphasis on, on mystery, and in the Western tradition, you kind of have a, a wide scope of views. Of course, there's the Roman uh, Roman Catholic view and transubstantiation. And then Protestants have a variety of views uh, on, on the Eucharist. But maybe you could talk to us about the connection between Eucharistic theology and ecclesiology. In what ways do these meld? In what ways does maybe one's view of the Eucharist guide their view of ecclesiology. Yeah, good. Um, again, if we go back to the New Testament, um, every New Testament um, researcher agrees that um, before his departure and ascension and death and resurrection, um, our Lord and Savior instituted uh, the Lord's uh, Supper or the Eucharist the sacrament of the table. The, um, it's also um, uncontested that um, the New Testament uh, sets very few rules about how often, how, and uh, under whose leadership to celebrate the, the Eucharist. So there's a lot of uh, flexibility. And therefore, it's understandable that uh, during the centuries uh, of church history, various kinds of emphasis arose. In the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek-speaking church, the Eucharist uh, came to play a very important role in two senses. One, uh, it's of course a very important uh, spiritual uh, and sacramental event, but more importantly, in Eastern Orthodox theology, there was the idea that uh, the Eucharist makes the church. So the church emerges, the church um, be begins and uh, comes to existence when there is a um, celebration of the Eucharist under a legitimate bishop. So it means that the, the whole center of the uh, Christian life is the, uh, is the celebration of the sacrament of uh, Eucharist. In the Roman Catholic Church, um, um, it is also a very central um, um, event because uh, in principle, as a Roman Catholic, 
you should um, have or attend the mass every day. Mass meaning is a uh, worship service in which the Eucharist is celebrated. Of course, most Catholics uh, cannot do it, but those who are full-time priests and uh, monks and nuns um, do it. And their idea is that um, the, the Eucharist uh, is the main source and main summit, as they say, of uh, spiritual growth and spiritual energy. Now, on the uh, Protestant side, particularly on the Lutheran side, there is no downplaying the importance uh, of the Eucharist, but um, according to our so-called ecclesiological rule in um, Augsburg Confession, uh, paragraph 7, the church is where there is uh, the right celebration of the sacraments, and uh, the true or the preaching of the true gospel. So, uh, in Protestant churches, the celebration of the sacrament of the Eucharist goes uh, very is uh, linked very tightly to the preaching of the gospel. But even then, there's a lot of flexibility. Like uh, in my own Lutheran church, uh, ELCA. Um, every Sunday when we have uh, a worship service, unless there's a reason not to, we have the celebration of the sacrament of the Eucharist. In Mekane Jesus Church, only the first week, the first Sunday of each month has the celebration of the Eucharist. In the uh, Lutheran Church in Finland, every other, uh, every second uh, Sunday has the uh, Eucharist, uh, celebrates the Eucharist, and then the other one is the so-called uh, word worship. And when we then um, go uh, farther uh, down or farther up uh, in our ecclesiological spectrum, when we come to free churches, they don't understand um, either water baptism or uh, the Lord's uh, Supper as a sacrament. Now, what, and I have to pause here, so sacrament means an event which um, affects what it promises. Like, for example, when um, uh, in sacramental understanding, water baptism makes the Christian, it not only promises to the baptized that you may become a Christian, but it makes the person Christian. In free churches, Anabaptists, Baptists, uh, Holiness uh, Churches, Pentecostals, they don't, uh, even if they talk about the sacrament, their theology is not sacramental. They rather talk about an ordinance. And this uh, is easy to explain in the context of water baptism. Whereas uh, Orthodox, Roman Catholics, and mainstream Protestants, whether they're Lutherans, say, that um, the way to become a Christian is to believe and be baptized. Um, the free churches are saying that, no, you first become a Christian. You uh, receive Christ as your savior. Your sins are forgiven. You confess your faith in Christ. And then as a matter of obedience, you will take up uh, water baptism and you also uh, celebrate uh, the Eucharist maybe once a month. So, because it's ordained by Christ, Christ uh, says, uh, do this in remembrance of me. So, it's not sacramental, it is more a matter of obedience and uh, uh, to be obedient to Christ's um, um, ordinances. So, that's a kind of uh, ecclesiological or kind of ecumenical overview of various ways of thinking about the relationship between the sacraments and ecclesiology, sacraments and Christian mm -hmm. life, church mm -hmm. life. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's, we, can you speak to us a little bit about the, I don't know, like principles of ecclesiology? So like I've got people who are watching right now all over the world. We get, we get the Anglicans, mm -hmm. Lutherans, Methodists, Prince, uh, uh, Presbyterians, Pentecostals. Um, to your point, we're going to have 
you know, free churches and enslaved churches. I'm just kidding. That's not the language. Uh, we're going to have churches all over the spectrum from all over the world. I get people in Germany right now in the chat that are watching, right? So how do I, how do I, uh, have a principle when it comes to ecclesiology? Like if you were to instruct a group of pastors from all over the world, what principle would you give them that would yep. be overarching and that could apply to all of their ecclesiological structures? You know, um, anyway, so I, I'd be curious, what would be the, if, if you could charge pastors in every tradition, what, what principle would you give them? Um, even though this is a big uh, question, like mouthful, I have an easy answer. And it is, uh, it can be summarized in one word, namely communion, communion. If you read uh, the New Testament and you know Greek, uh, the language of the New Testament, very often there is uh, the term, a uh, Greek term, a uh, koinonia, which means a uh, fellowship, sharing in communion, um, in all kinds of ways, spiritually, economically, in terms of partnership, uh, sharing in suffering, um, sharing the choice, and so on. And that one term distills and summarizes the main essence, the, the, the most important principle about the Christian church, namely, while becoming a Christian and being a Christian is a personal thing. It is you, it is I who believes in Christ or does not. While it is personal, it is not individualistic in a sense that it happens only between you and your Jesus. That is the fallacy and um, uh, misconception uh, of um, our hyper-individualistic culture. Many people say, I love Jesus, but I can't stand the church. You know those slogans. The moment you place your faith in Jesus as your personal savior and Lord, you are also entering through baptism, the Christian community. You live and die as a uh, member of the church. And let me give one example. I sometimes have students um, who, young students who come to me and say, Dr. K, that's not true. When I, they say, when I became a Christian, I did not go to any church meeting. I didn't have any evangelist um, to invite me to become a Christian. I read the Bible. I went into my room, I knelt beside uh, my bed, and I um, said uh, the sinner's prayer. And then the student says, that uh, tells you, Dr. K, that um, community is not really necessary to me. And I say, wrong, mistaken. First of all, you would not, I'm talk talking to the student, you would not have the Bible unless um, the church community had uh, carried it from the times of Jesus to our own times. You wouldn't know about Jesus unless you had a community which believes in Christ. You wouldn't even know the sinner's prayer and the need to repent unless there would have been a faithful, maybe failing, maybe sometimes uh, broken, but um, a faithful Christian community, which is now carrying the name and the legacy of Jesus. Therefore, um, we have to, to highlight the importance of Christian community, communion to particularly the Christians here in the global north, uh, USA and um, Europe. And um, as um, Eastern Orthodox uh, theologians uh, often say, if an individual Christian uh, fails or stumbles, that Christian fails or stumbles not as individual 
but as a member of the community, meaning that uh, there's also hope because I am not left alone. I placed my personal uh, faith in Christ and Christ is the head of the body. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, a thinker cannot say to the toe, I don't need you, or an eye cannot say to the ear, um, I'm better than you. I am needed and I need the others. Think about this body analogy. It's it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Uh, like in, in the body, there are um, there are things that are uh, invisible. There are things that we are ashamed of. There are things that we uh, show of. But they are all parts of the the body. Okay, so we're kind of coming up on our time here. So I'm going to ask you one more question. Someone was mentioning this in our comment section a little while ago, and I'm curious about it because I've, I've worked in this kind of movement before, the house church movement. Uh, and especially as we look in, in missions contexts around the world where uh, you, you're having disciples who are making disciples who are making disciples who are making disciples, praise God. And these disciples are, are growing these house churches and then people are splintering off from there and planting new churches as they make disciples and so on. And you have these massive movements of the gospel, mm-hmm. lots of people getting saved. So uh, I'm, I'm curious, just uh, what do you think of the house church movement, the church planting movement on the mission field? What's your take on those things? First of all, I tend uh, to be very flexible about diversity of um, uh, ecclesiological and ecclesial uh, expressions. So my default position is that whether you talk about the emerging church or a house church or a church plan, as long as the gospel is heard um, and Jesus is followed, I tend uh, to say amen. And it is uh, clear historically that uh, in the New Testament times, um, the Christians um, met and had as their church two places. Um, In the first place, like Book of Acts says, they met in the Jewish temples, temples of Israel, as long as they were allowed. And thereafter, they uh, changed uh, into houses and some of those houses began to expand and they were also made a little bit into like mini churches. For example, if you think of um, the church in Rome or the church in Corinth at the time when Paul wrote the epistles, there was not one like big uh, church where everybody met. Uh, Like in Rome, there were a number of smaller um, home churches which were kind of uh, small centers where people came uh, to worship. So that's uh, so it means that um, the idea of church being a kind of house church, its roots go very deep uh, into Christian history. And if you now look into China, the, the China house church movement, uh, perhaps 100 million Christians, who knows, maybe more, and there are also house churches in many uh, Islamic uh, contexts. They are mainly house churches because they are not allowed to be officially uh, Christian churches or they are suppressed and oppressed. Mm. But then, um, even in the global north, say in Europe and the US, there's a little bit overly idealized idea that um, rather than having a normal church like a Lutheran or Baptist or Pentecostal, we just meet uh, in the churches and be more informal. It's almost like against all kinds of uh, forms of institutionalization. My uh, counterpoint is that everything you do for a time being, it becomes an institution. Institutionalization is not the problem. It is a matter of what kind of institution you are building. Is it flexible? Is it facilitating your uh, ministry and vision? Or is it becoming a rigid, hierarchic, like stifling the original vision? 
And so I have seen many generations of, and I've studied some uh, house uh, church movements, um, and I've seen this kind of a little bit overly idealized um, a dream of beginning everything uh, from a scratch and reinventing the wheel. It's good. I, that's a, it's kind of a good way to wrap it up because it sounds like, hey, um, church traditions, institutions in and of themselves are not evil, but it's when the institution or the tradition of men, if you will, begins to nullify the word of God and the actual efficacy of what the church is commanded to do, that you have to reassess the institution. Uh, but any group of people that come together and agree on anything is an institution, um, like definitionally. So I think that's a that's a helpful way to think through it, kind of counsel through it work through that. I would encourage our, our audience who's out there watching, you're interested on ecclesiology, you're interested in church leadership. And we've done a recent uh, episode on charismatic church leadership that's in the archives that we've done. Uh, we've done e episodes with Mark Dever, uh, uh, Jeremy Rennie, I think I believe is his name, uh, on elders in, in church discipline. Lots of great content we've already produced on the subject, so I'd encourage you, if you're out there, hit the subscribe button, like the video, maybe go back into the archives, check out some of the older content we've done on ecclesiology, and uh, to pick up uh, Dr. Karkinen's book on an introduction to uh, ecclesiology. You can find that in Amazon. You can find it uh, if you're a subscriber of Ever And. It's up there. You can go check out the digital copy there as well. So, uh, Dr. Karkinen, thank you so much for jumping on the program with us today. Uh, any kind of... And uh, one more thing. Uh, sure. Uh, if you are really interested in learning more about ecclesiology, come and register as a student uh, at Fuller Theological Seminary. We provide uh, a lot of courses on theology, practice, worship, and mission of the church. It's a great place to study. Wonderful. Thank you for that uh, that final plug. So guys, thank you so much for tuning into this program. Make sure to subscribe, like the video, uh, and if you want to stay up to date on all the different things that are Remnant Radio, make sure to subscribe to the newsletter, which can be found in the link in the description or at the website, theremnantradio.com. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.